Welcome to my channel. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about the Chris, Letters to Christopher book, okay? So I finally got it. I actually pre-ordered it and I just got it a couple days ago. So I'm still in the process of reading it. I've only read the first five chapters first. But a couple weeks ago, you know, before I did those other videos on it, I had, I got the electronic copy. So I was able to kind of pick out certain parts and, well, the two videos I did on certain parts, just like random parts of the book. But I haven't read it, the whole thing, from start to finish yet. So that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm on, at, I'm on chapter six right now. So I wanted to talk about the first five chapters and then as I read it, uh, we'll just keep, keep doing it. So the next few videos will just be, you know, giving my thoughts on this book. So... And there's nothing like a book, you know. It's one thing to have an electronic copy, but to actually have the, a book for some reason, I don't know. It's just more appealing to me. Does anybody else feel that way? You know, I was so excited when I finally got the book, even though I had the electronic copy for weeks before that I got this. But when I actually got it, I was just all excited because I was like, oh, I don't know. I just like the feel of it. And, you know, you just lay in bed and just read a book. <laughs> I know it might sound silly, but... Just maybe well, I'm old school, you know, when we used to read books, it was the actual book. I'm not used to reading them online, so, but, so yeah, so the next few videos, I'll just, I'm going to be giving my thoughts on this, so let's go over the first five chapters so far. So the first, the first chapter kind of, you know, explains how it came to be, how this book came to be, basically, how she wrote him some letters and he, how he wrote back and her contact with his mom Cindy Watts and you know just kind of how the book came into into being basically and it kind of talks about you know the author's intention on this book and how she's trying to be as unbiased as possible you know it talks a little bit about demon possession and how prevalent it, it is and how the Vatican said that the demand for exorcist has been increasing. You know, it talks about how, you know, Shanann and Bella and Cece and Nico didn't deserve this and how, you know, horrific the crime was and how, uh, you know, it, this crime, this murder touched the whole community. Frederick, Colorado only has a population of 12,000 and how it's affected everybody in the town and how everybody would love to have revenge on Chris, um, how people would just drive by the house just to get a, a look at it. It talks about how he was a little upset when the FBI came and basically showed up without, without letting me know that they were going to be coming and how he kept a lot of information from them and about basically how it, this book is a way to get his truth out, to get his story out. And it also uh, makes a comment that the Watts family said it would be wrong for them to take any money from the book. So they're not getting any money from the book. Now remember, this is what Sherilyn is saying. So right now I'm just kind of giving you an overview of chapter one and what she says. And then of course I'll add some of my thoughts, but right now I'm just kind of summing up what she was saying in chapter one. Like I said, I'm not going to sit here and read it word for word or even read it. You know, I might at, read a couple quotes, but I'm just going to kind of give you my thoughts on the first five chapters right now. So it says, basically it talks about how, well, ask the question, what could cause a man with no history of violence or no history of a mental disorder to take the lives of his family? Like, what would cause that? I mean, he has no history of violence. He has no history of a mental disorder. And so she's just asking, well, what would what, what causes a man with no history to take his whole family, to murder his whole family? So, but the thing is, is my response to this is, I do believe he has a mental disorder. I, I do believe, strongly believe that he has a mental disorder. And I know she's saying there's no history of a mental disorder because nobody ever knew and there was no, you know, he never went to a psychologist where they, they diagnosed him with any mental disorder. But I think he, de that doesn't mean he doesn't have one. I think he definitely has a mental disorder. What it is, I'm not sure. It could be, you know, there's so many disorders and without, I don't think anybody could really say that as far as, you know, 
people that don't know them and they haven't you know not they're not a psychiatrist they're not they haven't talked to him on a one-on-one and analyzed them and you know asked him certain questions so I don't think anybody can know for sure but there's some ideas that we all could kind of agree that it so I think there's a couple different disorders that we could maybe guess that he could possibly have so one of them would be narcissistic personality disorder so he you know he has a lot of those traits so he could he could have that you know like we're all a lot of people speculate that he's a covert narcissist and I think there's a good possibility that yeah he probably is a covert or I shouldn't say probably but there's a good possibility that he is a covert narcissist for to know for sure if that's the ideal disorder to diagnose him with so I think we can all agree that he has some kind of mental disorder something's not right and I I I definitely do not think he feels any empathy. I really don't. You know, before this book, I still doubted. Not doubted that he was... I don't want to say that I doubted that he wasn't a bad guy and that he and what he did wasn't this evil thing, but I kind of doubted that whether or not that he felt any empathy. Like, I know, I knew, like, he, he didn't operate on a normal level as far as feeling empathy. But I wasn't sure, maybe he felt some, he just, or maybe, I also contemplated, well maybe he was just so obsessed with NK that that's all that mattered, you know? But after this book came out and hearing different things, I don't think he feels empathy at all. Like, I don't think he is able to feel any empathy whatsoever. I really don't. I don't think he has any remorse. I think he wants to have remorse. I think... He's just incapable of it. I really do believe that. I believe, I believe he's trying. I really do. I, I, I'm not trying in the sense where, I just feel like he's limited. I feel like he is incapable of feeling the way a normal, healthy, I should say emotionally and mentally healthy person feels. He's incapable of feeling that. He is. I really do believe that. And I think that he's trying to find God and he's trying to do the right thing but he just can't like it's just not there I, I, I just believe that his heart is not good it's not he's a bad soul and as much as he's trying like he's trying to get in the Bible and he's 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 getting into it mentally as far as he's reading it and memorizing it and trying to take it in and live by it but he's not feeling it like I don't believe that he's connected on an emotional level to it like I believe that he's not capable of feeling it he's he's not capable of having a good heart he doesn't have a good heart and as much as he tries he wants to I feel like he wants to he wants to he wants to try to you know read the bible and 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 go along with his teachings so he might just go through the motions and be able to quote the scriptures but there's a lack of connection i feel like he can't he's he's missing that connection because he doesn't have the capability of feeling like of that love he has no love in his heart and it's just not there and as much as he tries it's he's always going to come up short because something is just wired wrong with him where he is not capable of it and i think it's pretty obvious especially now after this book that he's just not i mean like sherilyn says he he never even once said he was sorry to his kids never even once never even thought of it when she asked him he's like oh i did it like the fact that he didn't even think of it shows you that it's because he wasn't feeling it. Like he, he tries to say all the right words of what he thinks he's supposed to say to be sorry and to be remorseful and to try to make it right. But the fact that he didn't even think to say the words, I am sorry to them, I think that shows a lot. I do. It's because he truly doesn't feel sorry. Like he knows he should feel sorry and he could say these words you know, saying how, you know, I did this horrible thing and, you know, his letter to him, to, like, professing how much he loves them and how they're just, he, they mean so much to him, but there's a disconnect there. Like, he doesn't actually really feel it. I really don't think, I feel like there's just, it's just empty. It's just emptiness. And it's not, 
his choice. I feel like he, it's not because he's not trying. Like, I think he, he, if he had a choice to feel that love and to be able to feel empathy and to be able to be compassionate and to be able to actually feel some remorse and guilt, then he would, but he doesn't have that choice because he's, he's, there's something not wired right with him and he just, he's incapable of it. The thing is, is I don't even think that he realizes that he's, that there's this issue with him not being able to feel empathy. Like that he, that he's different than a normal person that could feel this empathy. I don't think he even realizes that he doesn't have that because he ha he doesn't have anything to compare it to, okay? Because this is him and the only, uh, however he's felt this whole time, that's the only, I mean, that's the only thing he, ha he has to compare it to because if he doesn't know what it feels like to have real empathy, how does he even know that what he's feeling or not feeling is different from everybody else? So I think he doesn't realize that he's lacking that. So he thinks, well, in his head, he's trying to think, I think, I mean, that, this is just my opinion, but he's probably, I don't want to say probably, okay, this is just my opinion. So maybe he's thinking, well, I'm not a bad person. I don't, you know, I know I'm not a bad person. So if, if I did this, I had to have been possessed. Not realizing that, that maybe it's not him being possessed or having some demon inside of him. It's the fact that he was so obsessed with NK that, you know, he didn't care. He just wanted to be with her. And the fact that he could just take care, you know, just basically get rid of his family and not feel anything because this is what he wanted. So for him to get it, he had to get rid of his family. And the fact that he could just do that and, you know, be able to be able to do that and not feel so horrible and so guilty and so uh, this pain because you feel so bad for how, what, you know, what the, the trauma and the pain that you caused on people that you should have loved. So this should cause so much pain to you for the, for you. Have, well, first of all, like a normal person wouldn't be able to go through with that act I mean the act of doing it and then having to do it twice like that the the pain that you would feel for causing somebody else's pain like that would stop you right in the moment I mean you wouldn't even think about doing that but let's say you get past that and you do you do this act you know then the pain of thinking about what what you did to your family what you did to somebody people that you loved if he was able to love them like he okay if he was capable of loving like we love and so he loved his family like he said then the pain of hurting people that you love like that would be so intense that you wouldn't even be able to live with yourself or you I mean it would affect you and you would be feeling so horrible like it would bother you so much but the fact that, you know, you did that and you got on and, it, and emotionally it didn't even seem like it affected you at all. And then now you could say these words and they're like empty words. Like you know that that's what you're supposed to say and that you're supposed to feel that way. But you don't, you've never felt that, that real love and that empathy for somebody. So when you say that, I don't know if you're saying that knowing that, I don't think you're saying that knowing that what you're feeling or lack of feeling is not normal compared to what somebody else would feel. So I think you're thinking, oh, I'm, this is normal and, and it's just that's how somebody would feel after they killed their family and they really loved them. And you don't realize that love goes way deeper. Like it, it's deep down, and you, and you, normal person would, a normal person would feel that so intensely. So, I think I don't think you realize uh, you don't have anything to compare to. So I don't think you realize what other people would feel that were that were able to feel empathy. I don't think you realize what they what it would feel like for them to have killed their family and feel bad for it. I think you feel like it would just feel like how you feel. You know, so, and plus, I mean, especially being in a place right now where there's murderers and they probably do feel like you feel 
no remorse. So you think, well, that's just how people feel when they kill them. You know, they say they feel bad. They say these words. But, and this is how these words supposedly, like in your experience, this is what these words mean. Like how I'm feeling, that's what, when I say that, that's, God, I, I'm bad at explaining things. Okay, so when he says, like, oh, I feel bad, I feel guilty, I feel remorse, I feel so horrible. And then that feeling that you're feeling, which isn't anything, but, you know, I don't think it is really that deep. It's, it's like, it's really on the surface, but that's what you think it feels like to feel that way. Well, that's what you think other people feel, that, to feel empathy and to, or to feel sorry and to feel remorse. Does that make sense? So... But in reality, it's not. It's like you're not really feeling anything. So you don't know how deep and how painful that, like the Rusex, what pain they are really going through. Because if you're thinking it's how you feel pain and how you feel remorse and, you know, how you love somebody and how you would feel, then you don't realize the extent of what a normal, emotionally healthy person, how, how, horrible that that feels to them because if you're comparing it to how you feel remorse and how you feel empathy how you well lack of empathy like i said but how you're feeling it then you must think you know when you think how the rusex are feeling and you're comparing it to how you're feeling and you don't even know the extent of pain that their families going through and that other families go through and that people that love somebody when they lose somebody that what the, the pain, what their, what real deep pain feels like, because you're, you lack it, so you, I don't feel like, I feel like you're, you're not understanding, you will never fully understand, um, I'm not, I feel like you're trying, you know, you're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to get into the Bible, but I feel like you're just not connected, your heart's not connected, you're, you don't have a good heart, it's not, just not there, and as much as you try, not that you, you're not, you might try, and try to, you know, read the Bible and follow the teachings and, and and but there's no connection it just stops I mean it stops at that surface level as much as you try it's just just there's something not it's like almost like a bad egg you know a bad soul and I feel like you are a bad soul and there's just no way I don't I don't know I hate to say that because I know in the Bible you know even murderers can be saved and be redeemed but I don't know. I feel like that's something that I feel like God would have to somehow give you like a new heart or give you do something to change change you like physically or change your soul or I don't even know if I'm saying that right but I just feel like right now you're incapable and I don't see a change and I don't think you have the power to change from a bad heart to a good heart like from love from no love and empathy to love and empathy I don't think you have that power so it has to either it's not gonna come or it has to come from God or you're I mean I just don't see it I don't see that and I don't think it's came yet because I you could tell like from this these letters and just things we've heard recently that you're still that I don't know I know a lot of people call you covert narcissist and I think you have you do have if you have to if you have to label label what your traits and what you are and you know if you put them into a disorder I think you do fit the covert narcissist pretty well um, you probably do fit a lot of other a lot of other disorders too so all I know is I feel like that you don't feel empathy you don't you don't have love in your heart so yeah I think you know there's a good possibility if we had to put you into a into a label that a covert narcissist would fit you well so but if we're looking at like a bigger picture here and you know not necessarily giving you a label but just talking about how you are you know you just you're there's something missing and your heart is just not you just don't you know you're, it's like this Oh, it's just like this bad heart. I, I know that sounds horrible for me to say, and I don't. And I look, I feel bad saying this stuff about you, and you just you freaking could care less about. 
See, I feel bad about saying this stuff about you. I, I do right now. To say you're, it's like hopeless and you have a bad heart and it's, it's, it's possibility you could be saved, but right now I don't see it. I feel bad because that's your soul. Like, that's your eternal soul. That's, for, to say that, I mean, that's some serious stuff to say that, you know, your soul's basically no good. I mean, I, I do. I feel bad even saying that, but... That's what I believe right now. I really do. And uh, just, you know, I mean, nothing's impossible. And like, you're right. You know, there's people that murder in the Bible that is, they end up being, you know, redeemed by God. And you're right. But you have to have love in your heart. You have to be seriously, honestly sorry for what you did. And never do it again and never want to do it again. You can't just say, oh, I'll never do it again or, oh, I am sorry. You have to actually feel it because God knows. You can't just say you're sorry, but if it's not in your heart, then you can't be saved. I mean, that's how it, that's just, you know, obviously the people in the Bible that were killers that were, that ended up being saved and God, you know, forgave them or whatever. Obviously, they they had they they that's how they felt in their heart. They were actually really remorseful and they were really sorry and they and they were changed. They really were had they changed to have love in their heart. If that makes sense, I don't know. I might sound silly, but there's just all my opinion. Okay, it's definitely my opinion. So I mean, I wish I do wish you the best. I don't want to say the best, but I I do hope that you could somehow have love in your heart and somehow change but right now I don't see it and I don't think and I, I'm not saying that I think you're not trying because I do think that you want to and you're you wish you could and you think that maybe you've changed or you think that you're okay because you're reading the Bible and you could quote the scriptures and stuff but I just don't believe that you got a, a good heart that you're actually really truly sorry and but I, like I said I don't I think you think you are but I just I don't think you're there yet so I don't know if God's gonna choose to to save you or not I don't know if he is but and I know I don't think you really have control over right now what's in your heart I mean because right now it's like you're incapable so that's something I don't know I don't know how that works Okay, so I, my, my point on this big rant is I just think definitely there's some kind of mental disorder. How we would label mental, you know, in today's society we would call it a mental disorder. And I think, yes, you definitely do have something that's just not wired right. It's, it's not normal. Like you're, you're, you don't operate on a normal level as everybody else. So then the book goes on to say how the Watts family knew something was wrong. They said they felt something was wrong. They thought something's going to happen. This is before the murders, leading up to the murders. They just knew something was going to happen. So my question is, if you felt that way and you just knew something was going to happen, why didn't you say something? Like, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you talk to Chris? Why, why didn't you say, like, I just have this weird feeling? Or why didn't, I don't know, just say something or try to get to the bottom of it. I mean, I know, I'm not saying that that for sure would have worked because I know Chris was a private person. I know, you know, you've tried to talk to him and he just kept things inside. But did you at least try to talk to him and say, you know, I'm not feeling right. I feel like something's off. I mean, did you, it sounds like, doesn't sound like that you did that. So, like I said, not. I'm not saying that it would have changed anything, but it, it couldn't have hurt. You know, maybe it would have put him on a different trajectory. I mean, I can't even say say that word traje tra tra trajectory wow i know have you ever had that happen where either you try to pronounce a word a word that you pronounced a million times and had no problem and then all of a sudden you can't say it for some, some reason i don't know is that just me or and i'm kind of embarrassed even saying that but that's happened with i mean it's happened my whole life where there'll be words where yeah, your whole life you said them and then you try to pronounce it and for some reason you can't say it at that moment, you know, I don't know. Or words that, a common word that you've used a million times, but 
for some reason at that moment when you use it it sounds so weird like it doesn't even sound right you're just like is that really a word <laughs> Have you guys ever had this? Or is it just me? Am I weird? I don't know. That happens to me a lot. I mean, I don't want to say a lot, but it happens to me often. I mean, not like every day or anything, but maybe like once every couple months where, where I'll be talking and I'll say a word and I'll be like, wait a minute, is that a word? I even asked Randy. I'll be like, Randy, is uh. Let me think of or trajectory. Is that it? See, now I said it fine, but I couldn't just say it a minute ago. But I'll say, like, is that even a word? Why does that sound weird? And he'll just laugh at me and be like, yes, it's a word. It'll, it'll just, it'll usually, it's like a common word. Like, um, I'm trying to think of something like thought. No, I mean, I don't think that's ever happened with thought, but I'm just trying to give you an example. I'll be like, that sounds weird. Is that even a word? Or like spelling it out. It'll be like, I'll spell spell it out and I'll be, it'll look so weird. I'll be like, that's, why does that look so weird when I spell it, when I write it out? I'll, and it's usually <laughs> poor Randy will be like, is that spelled right? Is that even a, like what, why does that look so weird? And he'll just laugh at me and be like, yep. It's just like this, this lapse in my memory or something. It's weird. And, and, and then any other day the word's fine or it's spelled, I spell it and I don't think twice about it or I say it fine. but. On so, that one day, once in a while, it'll just be weird. <laughs> just tell me, comment. Is it, have you guys had this experience, or is it just weird old me that this happens to? Okay, so let me continue here. Sorry. <laughs> but um, like he said, the trajectory, it's, uh, you know, it could have changed everything. If He even says, actually... Oh, was that this book? Now I'm getting this book because um, I'm <laughs> I'm reading this book. Oh, I just got done reading Cindy's book. Well, the first five chapters of Cindy's book. And, you know, I'm reading this one, so I'm kind of getting this mixed up. Um, who said... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The part in the book where he says... Was that this book? Where he... Oh, my gosh. I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was... Yeah, because it was coming from Chris, where he said he wishes if somebody were to tell him to... How did he word that? I talked about it in my, one of my videos. Basically, uh, I don't know exact words that he used, but basically he wishes somebody would have said, you know, stop this affair, it's not right. He said he wishes somebody would have told him that because then it, he could have changed and it might have changed everything, which I don't believe in the least bit that that would have made a difference. You know, if anybody even mentioned it, he would have kept doing what he was going to do. But if you were to believe that in any sense of it, then if, going back to the, the Watts saying that they felt something was wrong and they just felt like something was going to happen, then maybe if you would have said something about how you were feeling, how you just didn't, you know, you just felt something was going to go on, maybe you could have got it out of him, you know, about NK, or maybe it would have made him think, like, wait, well, you know, uh, what, well, yeah, you're right, well, what am I even thinking? I don't, I personally don't believe it would have made a difference, but I'm just saying, in his words, he obviously, well, not obviously, he said that, you know, if somebody would have mentioned something to him, he could, he, it might have changed everything. So, whether or not that's true or not. But still, it does make you wonder that if you did feel that way, whether it was going to change anything or not. Now, looking back from what we know, but at the time, you know, you would think he, he would have said something. So, my question is, did, did you tell him that you were feeling like something was going to happen or not? And then another thing that I found kind of weird, and I'm kind of confused because the author, Sherilyn says that Christopher doesn't give excuses. But to me, like, this whole book is a book of excuses. He keeps talking about the evil spirits around him, the demon inside of him, um, that, you know, supposedly was finally released in prison, you know, and God, he said when he, he basically kneeled on the bed and cried on his hands and knees, basically, and he just cried and he felt like God what, put his hand on his shoulder or whatever, and that's where he felt that the demon left him. I mean, to me, is that, is that not an excuse? I mean, just the, I mean, what I'm trying to say is just 
trying to put the blame on something besides yourself to me is what defines an excuse like you're excusing your behavior because of some kind of external factor you know some kind of outside influence so you saying like maybe there's a demon or you know you blame Shanann a lot about how she emasculated you and bossed you around and you were just it was just building up inside until you're ready to ex explode or implode or however you want to word it so isn't that excuses i mean the whole book is full of excuses in my opinion i feel like so for her to say that you that chris doesn't give excuses i don't understand why we're how she could even am i missing something because to me the whole book is excuses so i'm a little bit confused on that and also another example of an excuse that he uses is he he mentions this and he even mentions this in one you know his second confession too so he's mentioned this multiple times that he says if it wasn't for nk that he would never have killed his family so that's an excuse too I mean, he's blaming her, you know, so he, he's blaming her in like an influence kind of way. Like, you know, if it wasn't for his affair with NK, you know, he would never have killed his family. So another excuse for why he did what he did. To me, I mean, those, is that, are those not excuses? So, you know, the demon, dark spirits shenan and nk so that's basically three excuses that he gives and those are the theme of the whole book of these um experiences or i should say details of these excuses of all this how it all led up to do him doing what he did it all it's all about what these factors that made him do it you know not him just being a bad person or just I don't even know how to word it, but, and I'm not saying that these aren't valid excuses. I'm not saying they are or aren't, but what I'm saying is that they are excuses. So, and of course, you know, somebody murders their family, there's usually a reason, you know, so there usually is going to be an excuse. So that, so I'm not trying to argue the fact that he's given excuses but i'm just trying to i'm just confused why the author said that he doesn't give excuses when the whole book is excuses so the author says how he never talked about insanity but just the darkness that came over him but if you think about it being possessed and insane both make what you're doing out of your control it kind of i know i try to explain it in one of my videos but but see, if you think about it, I feel like being possessed and insanity are kind of the same thing. It just depends on how you look at it. But the symptoms are the same, I should say. So being possessed and insane both make what you do out of your control. Okay, it's like it's your, your, you don't have control over it of the, your choices basically. So I feel like there's a fine line between medical and mental influences compared to demonic influences. I feel like there's kind of a fine line. So what affects your body affects your soul and what affects your soul affects your body, right? So what does it mean to be insane? You can't perceive or respond to reality correctly when you're insane and also when you're under d demonic possession you're not going to be able to perceive or respond correctly to reality the reality around you isn't the normal reality that you're used to perceiving okay so the new testament mentions demons over a hundred times right the bible itself makes distinctions between disease and possession okay so i'm just going to read you some of the some of the um distinctions between basically you know a disease which would be a mental disorder versus possession so basically between mental disorders versus demonic possession okay the first one is attraction to versus aversion to religion demons want nothing to do with christ okay so 
So basically it's saying that a demon is not going to be attracted to somebody that, you know, is heavily into the Bible and is studying it, you know, goes to church all the time and is reading the Bible and is just Christ-like, right? Because demons like to exploit vulnerable and weak people. For instance, if somebody is living in sin, okay, so they're not living Christ-like, they may try to influence them because you'll be easier and more vulnerable, you know? So they, if you're following the ways of God and go, you know, following Jesus' teachings and, you know, just living, a, you know, a, a good morally right life and, you know, basically Christ-like life, then you're not going to be as vulnerable. Demons are going to be more turned off to you, right? Because you're, first of all, you're not as vulnerable, you're not as weak to them. So they're, they're going to be more attracted to people living in sin because that makes people that are living in sin will make it makes them more vulnerable to the demons, okay? So for instance, Chris was pretty vulnerable at the time, if you think about it, because he was having an affair. Who knows what else he was doing? You know, he liked to spend a lot of money. I mean, I don't care what you guys say. You know, I, you know, people saying, oh, Shinian was the one that spent all the money and, you know, Chris didn't have any control over it. No, there was different times and examples of people that brought up where Chris liked to spend the money too and he knew when she got paid and he had a lot of clothes and he had a lot of nice things too so he was more into spending money than what you know he would lead people to believe also the sexual things could be a sin depending on what they are and we know well we don't know for sure but we've seen what NK was looking up, so we're, I guess we speculate what maybe they did in the bedroom, and some of that stuff could be looked at as a sinful type practice, you know. So, plus, of course, having an affair, I mean, that definitely goes against what the Bible says. So, you know, he, he was definitely living in sin, so he was... He was a vulnerable, I feel like. Now, I'm not saying, don't get the wrong way, I'm just kind of going by what the book says. I'm not saying I believe that he was possessed, because I don't think I do. I think he's just making, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that he was possessed or under, under some de demonic possession or whatever. It's just, I feel like he, he, not wanting to just take responsibility of this and he he keeps trying to find someone to blame I don't know I don't know I mean I know it's possible I do believe in possession I do but I just feel like he's a liar and I just have trouble believing a single word that he says and they're more you know turned off by people that are basically, you know, Christ-like, following God and trying to go with, along with the teachings of the Bible and just basically living a morally right life and just like a more Christ-like life. They're more turned off by that. So the second distinction is irrational speech versus rational speech. Okay, so in, in the New Testament, accounts involving demons, the demons spoke in a rational manner. So they're saying, you know, in the Bible, demons were basically more rational. They were more logical, you know. It just made more sense. When they spoke, it made sense. It, so a rational speech, I, I, I feel like Chris had, was, had rational. He was rational in his speech. So it's saying, well... I don't know. What do you guys think? Because it's saying, this one is saying, basically, the ir irrational speech is the one, the mental disorder, okay? And the rational speech is the demon possession. So, you know, I mean, I guess I would say he was more rational when speaking than irrational. But, I mean, I guess there were times where he wasn't really making too much sense. I don't know, let me know where you guys think he falls on that one. So then there's ordinary learning versus supernatural knowledge. 
So demons in the New Testament would speak through people to convey knowledge that otherwise could not have been known. So this person would have knowledge and would be speaking this knowledge and there would be no other way that they would know because they didn't acquire it by like a normal learning. Like, uh, like somebody that's insane or somebody with a mental disorder that do doesn't have, that isn't possessed. Would If they had any knowledge, it would only be knowledge that they acquired by normal learning. Like they, there's no way that they would know something that that they didn't experience for themselves, learn themselves, read somewhere, um, experience it, you know, that they didn't learn in, on a, how normal normally people would acquire this knowledge, okay? But a demon can know things that they shouldn't know because they didn't experience it, they didn't read it, they didn't learn it the way a, a normal per anybody else would learn it. I mean, they have no personal knowledge or no personal connection to the knowledge like they're they shouldn't know this this stuff okay so basically when you're possessed by a demon they could bring outside information and knowledge inside you and then when they are basically taking over your body and your voice and your thoughts they could speak through you and say things that you never learned I mean, you have no experience, you have no knowledge of this, but they do, so they can speak through you, okay? But, um, so they, they call that supernatural knowledge, but somebody that isn't possessed would have to acquire this knowledge from by normal learning. So, if you're just, if you just have a mental disorder and you're, not possessed, then any knowledge that you would have or speak, you know, would be something you acquired from your own experiences, your own, um, your own personal, um, le acquired learning, like how everybody else learns. It was something you would have, you would had would have read or experienced or acquired yourself, okay? Okay, so then number four is normal versus occultic phenomena. So, it talks about how uh, the demon activity that's just spooky, like levitations and trances and telepathy and ex poltergeists and just, you know, all the stuff you see in movies. But they say how that activity will have an impact on others in the room and not just the possessed, okay? So, you know, if somebody's levitating, other people could see it. It's not just in the mind of the person that's levitating and possessed, but it affects everybody. Or if they're in a trance, somebody else could see what's going on, you know? So, but compared to somebody with a mental disorder, that only affects them, okay? So, it only affects the person with the mental disorder. So, for example, let's say, um, you know, you're hallucinating, you know, and you're seeing things. Only that person is able to see it. The people, any outside people aren't, don't see what you're hallucinating or don't hear what you're hallucinating. Only the person with the mental disorder is, is seeing that, is affected by that. So, or like somebody is having like these certain thoughts or whatever. It's, it's not or they're perceiving something crazy, like uh, just paranoid about something. Nobody else is seeing it that way. They're, you know, they don't have those thoughts and they're not paranoid or, you know what I'm saying? They're, it's only the person that has the mental disorder. Okay, so the next one, number five. Okay, so this is talking about how people that are possessed don't sit there and announce it. It's like, it's not like they're, they want everybody to know and they just volunteer the information and tell everybody, hey, I'm possessed. Like demons don't want people to know. They want, they wish to be secretive. They, they, they don't volunteer that information. It's like they don't want people to know. So that makes me wonder why, I mean, Chris is going around telling everybody that. So if they don't, if they don't want it to be known, I wonder why, if he really was possessed, why would he be telling everybody? 
I guess I guess they're saying the demon. So if the demon is not in him anymore, then it, the demon is the. It looks. It seems like you're saying that it, the demon wants to be secretive. So if the demon is not in him anymore, then you know, it's the demon that wants to be secretive, not the person that's possessed. That's what I think that's saying. So I don't know, but I I just. I don't know. For some reason with him. I mean, I do believe in, like, demons may influencing people and just having, you know, some kind of effect on people. But I don't, I don't know why. I just, I'm, ha I'm not believing him for some reason. So, so it's saying that, that people, well, it's saying people that, that claim to be possessed are very likely not possessed. And this is coming from doctors with, that have clinical experiences with both demon possession and mental illness, okay? So it's coming from people that have some experience and they say normally people that claim that they're possessed aren't possessed, that they just have some kind of mental disorder, so. Okay, so number six is effects of therapy. So if the person is possessed prays and it solves the problem, or for instance, you know, they get a priest and, you know, they say the prayers and they do the exorcist and it solves the problem, then it probably was not a mental disorder or insanity, okay? And then it says if medicine solves the problem, then it probably wasn't demon possession. So, see, that's why I feel like they, he should get evaluated. I don't know why they don't make him get psychologically evaluated because... Let's see if medicine helps. Let's see if they could, you know, diagnose him correctly and give him some medicine and see if it helps. Okay, because, but see, I know he's claiming that, you know, basically prayer did help him. You know, he's saying how, you know, he prayed and, you know, he felt the demon come out of him. So he's claiming that prayer helped, but I don't believe he's still help. He's, he's helped. I don't believe he's um, saved. You know, I believe he still is suffering with this mental disorder that caused him to do what he did. I that's my opinion, but I know he would say, I'm sure that oh, it was the I was oh yep, yeah, prayer helped, so it must have definitely been possessed. I'm not saying that in his mind that he doesn't maybe really believe that it helped, but I don't believe it did. I don't believe that he's changed at all and that, that where he was at that time and now that he's a different person and he's just changed and he's, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't believe it. So I believe that maybe they should make him get evaluated and they need to give him the correct medicine and you know he's got the rest of his life to try different medicines if one medicine isn't the right one you try another one you try another one you reevaluate him until you find the right one but the problem with him is because he lies so much nobody would know if he number one was lying about what he would say to a psychiatrist number two you know if he if he was just saying that, oh, you know, oh yeah, this medicine helped, or this medicine helped, oh, I'm better now, that if he really even was any better, or if he was just saying that, or if he, I don't know, because obviously if, if for some reason he is lying about this demon possession, then he said he was all better after he prayed, and God, you know, that night where the demon came out of him. So he's he's willing to lie about that. If he did lie about that, then he, you know, he could be willing to lie about that medicine working. I don't know. I still don't know. Like I said, I'm leaning more towards I think he's full of it, but and but like I said, I'm not saying that I don't believe in demon possession and demon influence and Satan's effects on this country, this world, but you know, this country is, I feel like is very influenced by Satan, um, Satan's like influence. I don't know, just, there's a lot of evil in this world that I think all 
goes back to his, you know, Satan's influence. So I'm not saying, because if you look at it like this, that in a way, I guess it, it, he is under Satan's influence because anything evil like that obviously is influenced by Satan. Obviously, it's it's some somehow influenced by Satan. But you could say that with all the evil in the world, because anything that's not good comes from Satan. So Chris's action and him himself isn't good. So yeah, it is some kind of influence by Satan. If you if you look at it like that. But as far as um, what I'm having trouble believing that it was just a temporary thing, like it was just this possession by Satan for those couple weeks or ever since he met NK, or whatever he wants to say, and that before that, it wasn't, he wasn't influenced, and after that, you know, it, it just left him, and he, it, now he's okay, he's fine, and he, he's a good person now. I don't see it like that. I think his whole soul, his whole um, life on earth has been influenced by Satan. It has been, I feel... Satan has kind of maybe attached to him. Not in the sense where, you know, you see on the movies and people are possessed, but just because all that's, like I said, all this not good and all this evil, Satan play, plays a part in that, right? So if you look at it like that, then yeah, what he did and him, his soul is not good and you know he's following satan if you think about it but it's not in the terms where he's trying to like how he's thinking like how it was just like this possession of for a short period of time and then it just left him like how you see in the movies i don't believe it's like that kind of a possession but i do believe that you know any evil thing like that Satan does play a part in that. He is the influence. He is the one, you know, behind that. But I don't believe it's possession like how he's saying, how he has no control. You know, his free choice is taken away, basically. Like, he's talking about possession in a way where he doesn't have free choice. And basically the demon is making all the choices for him. So it's like he's taken the blame away from him and it was all the demon possession made him do it. I don't believe in it in that sense. But I believe in it, uh, the sense of his soul is basically tainted or I don't even know what, what was a better word for that. But influenced by Satan, his whole life on earth was kind of, you know, somehow he fell into that evil... I don't know, maybe he let his guard down a little bit and, and Satan, he just, I feel like his soul is just somehow connected to Satan. Like, I don't know, I don't know how to word it and I don't know, it's not like that Satan is controlling him, but he's, Satan's influencing him. But he ultimately still has free choice. That's, I guess that's my point I'm trying to make. I don't believe that he was possessed in the sense where he doesn't have any free choice and, and Satan or the demon is making all his choices. I believe he still has free choice and he keeps choosing that. He's choosing, he's going along with Satan's ways. He's going against God when he chooses, when he chose all the um, choices he made that led up to the murder. So. I believe he did have free choice, and so I don't, I don't believe in the saint possession or um, demonic possession in those terms. But I believe that, of course, something that evil is definitely influenced by Satan. But he chose that. He chose those choices that went along with Satan's ways rather than God's ways. So, 
So then it talks about how uh, poor Chris couldn't bear the things that were being said to him in court that day when he was in court. Frank and Sandy read their letter. Frankie, um, Cindy, where they all read the letters. And basically the day where they sentenced him. So he's saying how he just couldn't bear the things that were being said to him in court that day, okay? So, but according to him, that day he would have still been possessed, right? Because he said that it wasn't until that night that he realized he had a demon inside of him, okay? So, and we all know that he said that it came in the form of his grandparents. So if he had this evil inside him that day in court, why would it bother him so much to hear those things? I mean, if he was possessed by a demon, he wouldn't think he could care less about hearing those things, you know? Why? He wouldn't care. I mean, do you think he would? I don't know. If he was supposedly possessed, he wouldn't think that it would even bother him. Oh wait, so it said he couldn't bear the things that were being said about him in court that day. So, I guess, I mean, I guess maybe, because if you have a, a demon inside you, you'd be, I guess, maybe concerned only about yourself. I don't know, but my biggest issue is the fact that he's bringing up he couldn't bear what was being said about him in court that day. What about the things that were, were being said about what his daughters went through? I mean couldn't stand what we're being said about him, but what about, think about, huh, I don't even know, I, I don't even want to go there. Think about the trauma that your daughters went through, but you couldn't bear what was being said about you? What? I mean, come on. Think about, wow, how they couldn't bear what was being done to them. I mean, what a selfish and narcissist thing to say. Think about what well, think about that. What you saying that? They were talking about your poor, beautiful daughters and the trauma that they went through that morning, and you're saying that you couldn't bear the things that they were saying about you. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not understanding how, how and why you even said that, but. It seems pretty narcissist thing to say, in my opinion. So, and you're, I mean, it seems like that would be a statement you would say when you're so concerned about yourself and so concerned about how others will think of you or see you or what they're going to say about you rather than concern about your family and what... Think about the trauma that, the, that they had to go through, but you're worried about what's being said about you? What about what happened to your family? What about what, about what the Rusex got to go through now? I mean, uh, both families. I mean, but you're only concerned about yourself and what people are saying about you? I mean, that... I don't even know what to say about that. That just is the most selfish thing to say especially in this at this moment I mean at that time that's how you respond to that about every that day in court was so hard to watch because hearing those details of what what happened but you're saying it was just so hard to bear what was being said about you I mean, wouldn't it, shouldn't it be, it was so hard to hear about what was being said about your family and what happened to them? That would be the normal thing to feel and say. Okay, so I want to read you a quote from the book because some people are, when I put those videos out, uh, my first couple of videos that I did about the book, just my opinions, and how I brought up how I, th I thought it seemed like little hints of uh, that were said in the book that seemed like they were going to try to go go with the insanity defense. Um, just hinting around like maybe they were going to try to appeal. So I just found a quote in the book and listening to this, I, I want you guys to think and 
honestly tell me after hearing this and this is only you know one of the quotes but after reading the book but even just this one quote you still don't believe that the insanity defense was the what the author was talking about when she said this book would be grounds for an appeal I just want you to think and as you're reading the book about her saying that the book would be grounds for an appeal and then think about what you know reading the book why would they be able, okay what would be some of the circumstances that they'd be able to appeal with the information that is in this book okay and hopefully you'll see that it's insanity it's the insanity that they're going to try to do at least that that was the intention um, of the idea I should say the intention of our the idea behind that quote or the idea behind her saying this could be grounds for an appeal that's what I feel like she was referring to is they were going to try to maybe go for an appeal using the insanity defense I'm not saying that they would win no 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 that would be a miracle but I'm saying I think that's what she was referring to when she said it is she she was trying to say that possibly they could appeal using the insanity defense after some of the um, after this book came out and you know what it said and some of the things that they brought up but by no means whatsoever do I feel like that they would ever have a chance or I shouldn't say they but that Chris would ever have a chance to win I don't believe that or that would have a chance to appeal it I should say and even if he was able to appeal it then what okay let's say you're able to appeal it and then what would come next though would there be a new trial or a new trial there never was one trial but would there be a trial or what would I don't know what the next step would be I'm not sure when it comes to that but I mean do you guys still don't believe me that the intention of this not the intention of the whole book but the that they possibly were looking to, or how do I word this that when she said that, that that's what she meant or do you guys still don't see that because remember in my first two like a couple weeks ago when I put out the first couple videos when I had like a, a few pages before the book even came out I had some pages of the book and I told you you know throughout both videos I kept saying wow it seems like just by little things I would catch in the book that they're trying to hint that maybe he was insane or you know possessed but it was it was trying to all lead into the same point that he didn't have a choice and it was out of his control and it was just like it's just a theme in the book that it was like he didn't have control over it and he was overtaken overpowered that he he he, he, he had no choice like it was just something that he could not control it was something that he like it's almost like that he had no free choice it was so if you know they hint to some demon possession that get. but here's a quote in the book so it says so this is where I stepped from normal life into the life of the insane I have always believed a person who could kill someone in cold blood must be insane no one could possibly be sane and do this I mean right there it's it's basically saying that it, it would be possible for somebody to do this and not be insane so I don't think that I don't know are they really gonna tr I mean is he really gonna try for an appeal or I'm not sure what's gonna happen but I mean if you guys read the book you'll see just as you read it different parts where it's I feel like certain things that are said to to help with the appeal if he were to uh, try to appeal to give that um, idea that he didn't have a choice you know he was controlled okay so I want to um, bring up a point when in his first letter his first le letter to Sherilyn he says he refers to um, the time where he feels that God was telling him to clear Shannon's name okay and that's when the FBI and CBI came to visit him so he thought he felt like that that was God telling him to this is time to clear Shannon's name and he even makes a comment where he says, well, if God tells you to do something, you do it. 
So my question is, what about those three times that you said God was telling you to stop your plan? Remember, you said you had three chances, and each time you ignored God then, so I don't understand. You're saying if God tells you to do it, you do it. Well, that's not true, because God told you three times, you said, try to get you to change, you know, change your plan and turn around and don't go through with it, but you didn't do it. You didn't listen, so why didn't you listen then? Remember that time, you know, the first time, as you said, when you were driving to NK's house and God made you lose control over the car? You said it was, you know, God trying to stop your plan and you didn't listen to God then? I don't, I mean, why didn't you listen to that, him then? But that happened three times, you said. So, he gave you a chance to listen three times and you ignored him. So what makes you think that now God even wants to talk to you? or he even wants you to listen or he yeah basically he even wants to give you another chance I, I should say I'm not saying that he doesn't and that he wouldn't but you have to get the hate out of your heart you have to get the evil out of you and I don't believe you have I don't I just don't believe you have a good soul and love in your heart and I don't I know it's not your choice necessarily because you can't help I feel like you can't help that you don't have Uh, a good soul, you know, that you're not able to care about people or empathize with people and you just don't have love in your heart and I don't think that you really have a choice in that, but I do believe that you do have free choice. I don't think you, so I don't think you have choice in the fact that you can't make yourself be able to feel that empathy and feel love and feel compassion. Because I just feel like you're incapable of that. It's just something that you just, something that's off. That you just aren't, you don't, you don't have the proper um, biology. You just don't have the proper biology to feel this stuff. So that I believe that you don't, you can't, you, you don't have a choice. You can't make yourself be able to empathize with people or feel certain feelings because you're just incapable of it but I still believe that you have free choice and make you know in your choices so you can still choose not to kill and choose not to hate this you know and choose not to be mean to somebody and choose not to hurt somebody and choose not to be violent and, you know you still have uh, free choice just because you can't feel guilt and remorse and empathy and compassion and you don't have sympathy for people you just can't you don't ha you're not capable of it doesn't mean that you have to choose murdering people or you know choose bad choices or choose choices that hurt people and it's mean and evil you still have that free choice because not all, like, for instance, psychopaths, not all. Psychopaths don't have the ability to empathize or they don't feel guilt or remorse, just like that. But not all psychopaths are murderers. Not all sociopaths are murderers. Not all narcissists are murderers. Because they still have free choice and not all of them choose to murder, okay? Just because if they did murder somebody, they wouldn't feel like that guilt and remorse from it doesn't mean that they're going to do it. So a lot of them don't choose that. So my problem here with you is that you still chose to do that. And that's what I just can't, I'm having trouble forgiving. And I, I shouldn't say I do forgive you. I do because I, you know, you just, you have to forgive people, but I don't think that you're a good person. I don't. Thank you.